Uh, today, we're going to be talking about alcohol and fitness and recovery, and that's Heather that's going to be doing that today. So remember, we got some interesting things coming up, and next week, um, we have uh, Prevention in Rural America, which will be uh, by Ruth, so that should be good. We, then we have uh, Ryan Kelly coming back, and we have a little bit of an opening there, and I'm probably going to be doing my suicide and substance use disorder talk during that day. So uh, we'll kind of see how that plays out. We also have some other people looking at it, but lots of great talks coming up. So remember free CME, make sure that you tell us that there's somebody else in your room so we can kind of get them on that list as well. And if you uh, please want to turn on your video, that is always the most fun if we can see you. So that would be great. Uh, remember, if you need to call us, you sure can. We can, you can call Aaron, who's you, I think you can see on here. Yep. And uh, you can call Aaron or one of us and kind of get some information. Remember, you can go to the CORE website, too. We, we do not have the manual up on that yet, but that hopefully is coming soon. But there's lots of other information that you might want to reach out and look at. Uh, remember the weekly addiction topics. We actually just did one on eyes and alcohol. Uh, and the one, the follow-up one is actually eyes, uh, eye color and alcohol use disorder. So uh, there's are some interesting talks. And uh, these are today's objectives, if you want to kind of quickly go through those otherwise Heather if you want to just go ahead okay so first of all I want to explain the beach scene today is acknowledge the weather day and it's also opposite day so I'm changing the actual weather around because it's snowing and icy out so we're pretending we're on a beach um okay so alcohol and exercise I'm going to explain how this even became a topic um I get runner's world and it was like this constant Thing about alcohol and exercise and running and that turned into a rabbit hole which is how I'm actually going to start so I'm going to go off on a tangent before I actually get to the exercise part um, because of course things have changed in recommendations so previously you know we've all kind of heard this is that you know a glass of wine can be acceptable and okay for your diet it's good for your heart um, if you go back and look at those old guidelines it actually says it could be beneficial for your heart health. More the red wine than the white wine. Now the World Heart Federation, um, there's a lot of federations. So starting in 2019, they actually have made the solid comment that no amount of alcohol is good for your heart. Um, and looking at data, we've all looked at a thousand times before and given a million times before is you know how many people are dying related to alcohol related causes. Um, and there is a little bit of a gender difference is that women typically don't consume as much, but the results are still that there are more implications. They have more physical issues, cognitive motor impairment. They actually go on to call alcohol, which I mean, it makes sense. It just seems very strong to me. Um, the psychoactive and harmful substance um, related just seems very strong, even related to a lot of other things. Um, I didn't go too far into the weeds on this, but even small amounts of alcohol, not even a drink a day can actually increase breast cancer risk substantially. So even less than the recommendation of maximum for women can actually have significant breast cancer ramifications. Um, and then the other kind of complications. Economic costs. So these are kind of all the reasons you shouldn't drink alcohol, and then I'll get into it more specifically in a minute with relation to the, the exercise component. But economically, a lot of money um, goes out related to, you know, the health conditions, all the morbidity and mortality things, health systems, especially if people are in and out of the health system, out of pocket, productivity losses there, it just adds up. If you look at Indirect things, about $1.87 trillion related now, according to all the new data. Well, this is the 2019 data. Um, and then I think this is just super interesting, is that how many years are lost due to alcohol in it, with all the people, how they're dying, even if it's alcohol related. There's just a lot of life years lost. It's not obviously everyone, 92 million, we're not all losing that individually, it's cumulatively. Society, of course, has negative implications related to alcohol, whether it's violence, criminal behavior, familial discord, homelessness. There's just a lot of things bad. This I found very interesting. 
there are 230 approximate different ICD-10 codes that are related to alcohol complications, can be related to just alcohol in general. There are 40 different of those diagnoses that would not even exist and have to be a diagnosis if not for alcohol being out there. This is very interesting also is that the difference in the country. So high sociodemographical index, so like the more developed countries, um, much higher morbidity and mortality rates than the low um, sociodemographic countries. So the more developed, the more morbidity and mortality you have related to alcohol. And then just in general, because this was done by the Heart Foundation, I felt like I should throw all these on there, all the different things that are related, which will play in in the upcoming slides with exercise, because obviously if you have any of these things that does directly impact your exercise, your endurance, your recovery. Um, their final statement was about kind of the social life and how this has just been an accepted thing We'll come back to the same comment later um, and how a lot of the studies that were done saying it's good for your heart health were done by alcohol, you know, companies. So kind of the whole Purdue Pharma doing their own research on the benefits of opioids. So it's kind of the thing. Um, the people that were looked at in these studies, you know, did not filter out different cultural beliefs, different religious beliefs. So they kind of looked at everybody as a whole, like, you're not drinking, you choose to not drink, great. But they didn't look at the whys, um, like a person who had never drank versus different other reasons. Um, so there's that. Their recommendations, I am definitely not going through these, but they're very interesting because they go into the recommendations for everybody. Um, the only one that says, you know, maybe is the ones with no underlying health conditions. So there's actually a best practices thing on alcohol related um, drinking here is this whole safer thing, which y'all can read through later. Um, but ultimately it's, we need to establish much more stringent rules and thoughts related to that. Okay, so that was my super tangent on that. I like to go inner monologue all over the place. So now we'll kind of get into the actual exercise component. So let's just specifically focus on the muscles. So there was this study done in this PLOS One journal. I wrote out that, what, what that actually is. I had never heard of that journal before. Um, it's published out of the Public Library of Science. Um, and it's, it's very interesting kind of, you know, it's, kind of like a PubMed, but not really. It's like JAMA, but much more acceptable or accessible, excuse me. And so they did this study here on what happens to muscles after, you know, alcohol and exercise and they're combined. Like, does alcohol really impact the ability to have endurance and to build muscle? And the reason they asked this question is because many sports, many team sports, especially, usually after competition or usually after you finish some type of big thing, there's celebration, whether it's the champagne in the locker room or you go and celebrate after something. And so the question is, is should they do this or is it even okay to do? I mean, the should is kind of, kind of funny. It's kind of obvious, but is it actually okay to do these celebrations or is it actually going to negatively impact them moving forward? Um, and so what is what actually happens? What does that look like? when we're looking at the muscles in general. So there, there are more scientific questions is what happens with protein turnover? And what about this myofibrillar protein synthesis, which is actually something that happens in our bodies after doing any type of exercise? And then how much is actually being built after exercise? You know, if you go lift weights and you, you know, you have some of those muscle fiber breakdowns to then build stronger muscle, what does that actually look like? How much is that really changing things? So what they did, a very small study, I will totally give that, eight physically active males, but they put them all through the same line. So randomized crossover. So they kind of all did these things multiple times over. And so what they did was they did, there's three different tracks. Again, they all end up going down each track to really know. They did some type of resistance exercise. It was a hit or it was like heavy lifting day. And then 
high intensity interval cycling. So it's almost like a stress test, but on the bike rather than on the treadmill. Right after the exercise, right after the um, the cycling was done, and then four hours later, they would consume either half a liter of whey protein, so like a protein beverage, or alcohol with the protein, or alcohol with some type of like a Gatorade or something. Now, disclaimer, it was a lot of alcohol, roughly seven drink equivalent, um, plus or minus in these groups. So that's a lot. Over what um, period of time? Um, well, immediately and then four hours later. So it was like they, the alcohol seven drinks was the two. They divided them. So three drinks immediately, three drinks four hours later. Wow. But the alcohol was combined with either a protein beverage or like the Gatorade. So they, it's like a mixed drink. Also, so in the middle of this immediate and four hours post-exercise, they'd have a carbohydrate-heavy meal, regardless of what other arms they were in. Then they also did muscle biopsies two hours after the exercise and eight hours after the exercise. What they found is there, if there was alcohol in any of the, the consumption, it reduced the rates of this protein synthesis. So it slowed and reduced the ability for the body to produce and make and re, remake those bindings of the muscle, even if the alcohol was combined with the protein, you know, compared to the carb. Um, it suppressed the ability of the anabolic response. So the ability of the muscle to build even in a low oxygen environment, therefore inhibiting adaptation. Um, you need that ability. So if you're, you know, really strenuous and you, your body turns into that anaerobic moment, whether it's something like hockey where it's almost straight anaerobic versus, you know, a strenuous day where you might kind of go in and out of anaerobic, um, it definitely impaired the ability of the body to adapt to those different environments. So as would be expected, the people whose muscles did the best were the ones that had just the straight protein drink followed by the alcohol with protein, followed by the alcohol with like the Gatorade beverage. Mostly not surprising. I would think this would be much more interesting if you use, which I would consider a much more reasonable amount of alcohol, like maybe a drink's worth right after or four hours after, not seven cumulative drinks. So now if we're looking at running, most of these studies are done in running. I wasn't just trying to you know, point to Kurt on this one for years and years of this. Most of them was done on running just because it's like a straight endurance activity. Hmm. Okay. So to kind of look back at the positives, um, you know, the study is that may, alcohol may increase your HDL, so your good cholesterol, but other things also do that, like surprise, surprise, exercise can also increase your HDL. And so the American Heart Association definitely recommends against consuming alcohol for potential health benefits. People will give that whole, well, I'm going to drink this red wine because it's good for my heart or it's good for my good cholesterol. Um, they don't recommend that. There was a study in nutrients, I didn't put the year, so I don't remember what it is. It's in the things at the end. They did HIT training, so the high intensity interval training twice a week with moderate alcohol amounts. And they found that this type of situation, alcohol had no negative effects on the body composition. They didn't look at the muscle specifically. They didn't look at the heart. They just said body composition up front, no changes. They did notice actually when there was alcohol, there was less body fat and potentially increased in lean muscle mass, but fairly small study. And they were all young adults, roughly 24 to, you know, well, 18 to 30. Um, that was one study. It's never been reproduced. So what we know is, and we'll kind of break some of these down again in a second, is that there are detrimental effects of alcohol on your ability to exercise. The diuretic will come back to, the glucose will come back to. Alcohol raises blood pressure. We've had this talk multiple times, is that people who quit consuming alcohol, their blood pressures do tend to improve. Um, those are the patients who have very hard to control blood pressure. Typically, patients who are consuming a lot of alcohol have increased calorie intake. So whether that's weight, it's that they might look healthy weight or even overweight, but it's all just kind of those empty calories um, 
extreme cases, obviously the stroke, the heart things, the things we talked about before. So this is where we're gonna break down a lot of the specifics of the physiology. And this study was done 2010 with the athletes kind of anecdote of, oh, a few beers the night before a race can help my performance, helps ease that pre-race anxiety that pretty much anybody who's ever done any type of exercise whatsoever, whether it's a game or a race, you have kind of that anxiety. Um, and then what about after the race? Like, do you get to celebrate? So they really looked at what happens if you were to consume beer or some type of alcohol the night before a race to help with that. So we'll break it down into the physiology. What happens? What, what's the physiological changes of alcohol? Um, how does it actually impact the actual performance? And then how does alcohol impact the recovery after whatever endurance activity that went, went took place? So physiologically, they looked at the skeletal muscle. So what we know with alcohol on board, the calcium influx into the muscle you know, cells, the myocytes, it inhibits that calcium influx. Therefore, you cannot get that excitation contraction. So the muscles are not able to contract as well. Therefore, you have less strength. So inhibiting the calcium, less strength. Um, and then the sarcolemmal integrity, obviously we all know what that is. Um, so it also compromises that. Therefore, the creatinine kinase goes up intracellularly. So, you know, when we look at people who have like rhabdo and the CK is very elevated, not good. We're going to come back to the CK though in a little bit because there's a different study that kind of shows it a little bit differently. Um, and we know that alcohol related to these above two things um, can create muscle cramping, um, muscle cramping and pain. Also, it ruins kind of that proprioception, your ability to know where you are in space, which fits with all the things we talked about in alcohol a couple of weeks ago, is that you lose a lot of that judgment, um, that the physical space judgment and, you know, your visual spatial as well. Thermal regulation and hydration. Alcohol is a diuretic, um, acts as a diuretic, and it acts as a diuretic by inhibiting the antidiuretic hormone. And so you get very dehydrated. Alcohol also acts as a peripheral vasodilator. So think of patients who get very, or people who get very flushed when they drink alcohol. It's because it dilates those blood vessels. When your blood vessels are dilated, especially, you know, surface level, you end up sweating more. And sweat is good in exercise to kind of keep your temperature balanced so you don't overheat. But if it's happening inappropriately due to the alcohol on board, it can actually worsen the dehydration and then lead to hypotension. So kind of the opposite of what sweating is supposed to do. This is like excessive sweating um, because of the vasodilation. And it's interesting because this happens mostly in the temperature extremes. So even if it's really, really hot, you can get hypotensive or you can get hypothermic because you're already sweating because of the heat. In low temperatures, you're already more likely to get hypothermic, but now you're sweating excessively because of the alcohol. And so your hypothermia can happen more than in like the ideal athletic temperature that we all would love to run every race in. Metabolism. So this is kind of the muscle thing. This is very complicated. Um, alcohol inhibits the rise in serum glucose. So when you're exercising, you want your serum glucose to go up because that's what you're burning when you're exercising. Alcohol can kind of inhibit that normal rise in glucose. So you don't have as much energy to be able to do whatever it is you're trying to do. During recovery, it lowers that serum glucose. So it also doesn't let you recover from that. Your body and your muscles need glucose there to help with the recovery and the muscle repair, kind of like we talked about before. And then if you're acutely drinking, so Twin Cities Marathon, mile 20, mile 22, there are people there handing out 
shots of beer. It's a frat house. So if you don't have to drink it, it's not like here's your Gatorade replacement, but they're handing it out. So if you're drinking that, it's actually going to minimize and it kind of impact the, the, the serum fatty acid concentration, which you also need, especially in the recovery phase, again, helping with the muscles. So well, it's not recommended to drink alcohol while you're running. Yeah, you, uh, was this research, it should have been done in 1983. That would have been really helpful. But I mean, I think anecdotally, people often during those times would would drink beer, uh, even in half marathons and marathons. I uh, That and caffeine products, uh, interestingly, back then. So yeah. hmm. the marathon, bro, because you're already dehydrated, 99% of the time you're hot and sweaty already, and then you throw alcohol on board. And now you're like, you get tipsy way faster because of all of the above so it gets worse and you stop because it all catches <laughs> it all catches up to you i heard that from a friend mm -hmm. yeah neurologically so we know that the more alcohol we consume the worse our balance reaction time visuals search so focus recognition memory and accuracy of your fine motor skills so especially if you're doing a trail race i'd really recommend against alcohol during that race you are going to trip and fall down the mountain um the more alcohol you have also impacts your sleep length and quality of sleep we always talk about Patients who say, well, I need that glass of wine or whatever to help me go to sleep at night, but then they wake up at 2 a.m. wide awake because of more of the stimulant properties. So it messes with the REM and the deep sleep. Talk a little bit about alcohol in relation to recovery here in a second. Okay, so what about alcohol in the actual performance? So aerobic performance. There's really no consensus or consequences, excuse me, no consequence on submaximal endurance. These are the early studies. Um, they really didn't explain what this even meant um, in terms of if you're drinking alcohol before, what about your performance and ability to do stick in the straight aerobic thing? referring to not a race situation. Like if you were to have a glass of, have a mimosa in the morning and go for a run later in the day and you're just going for an easy run or an easy walk or something light, is that going to impact you later? No one really knows, but kind of what this, the, the research is pointing to and what the researchers are all looking at right now, because there's a lot of research being done on this topic, is there is a threshold at which point any amount of alcohol or whatever dose dependent amount does impact where even light exercise is going to start being negatively impacted, such as drinking beer in the middle of a marathon. I'm assuming she has water in that water bottle, but I don't know for sure. Anaerobic performance, a lot of lacking. And the problem with being able to study anaerobic performance in, in a human is that anaerobic happens for short bits of time. So you'd have to somehow be able to measure something very rapidly as they go. Like, I don't know if you can put someone in a, a Bruce protocol stress test with like muscle biopsy things already in their legs to be able to pull things out. So it's a lot harder to tell. Okay, so recovery. So acute ingestion. So here's what the CK comes in. So if I were to drink alcohol right now and exercise, it doesn't look like there's much damage if we only look at the creatinine kinase. Now, if you go back to that previous slide, it's because the CK was increased intracellularly. So you're not going to be able to measure that. You can only measure the intercellular. But other pro-inflammatory kinase, like your interleukins, your TNFs, definitely get changed. They have higher levels of inflammatory um, cytokines throughout the system. So you're going to have much more inflammation in your body when there's alcohol on board and you're doing any type of physical activity. Mm. We already kind of know for the other study is that there is a decrease in protein synthesis. Um, so this study also confirmed what the PAR study did, although the PAR study came after. So that one confirms this one, I guess, that is related to the dose and the time in which alcohol was consumed. Um, 36 hours post-exercise is if you're drinking alcohol before you exercise or immediately after, you're going to have a lot more difficulty that 36 hours post-exercise. So this is, you're running a marathon, you get done running the marathon, you want to go out and celebrate. 
you are going to be miserable in a couple of days. You are still going to feel like you just got done running the marathon and not be able to walk. It's going to be delayed. It's not just the one or two days after the marathon, you're going to be miserable. It's going to continue um, because it's going to take your body longer to recover from that activity. Mm. So don't go out and celebrate after a marathon. You had to get on a plane to go to because you will be miserable when you fly home. And it's not just because you sat on an airplane. Another study done in the Sports Med Journal kind of confirmed the all of the above. I didn't go through the details of the study, but it alters the Im immunoendocrine function. All blood flow is altered, and a lot of that had to do with the vasodilation as well and the inability of the body to get the very well oxygenated blood where it needed to go because it all ends up going surface. Um, and then the protein synthesis in the skeletal muscle, again, was confirmed. Um, glycogen production is inhibited. So alcohol, obviously, goes through the liver. Liver needs to produce glycogen and all of the things to help with recovery. That also gets slowed because the liver is dealing with the alcohol. If alcohol is going to be consumed post-exercise, they recommend less than a half a gram per kilogram. So depending on the size of the human, two to three drinks at most within the first 24 hours. So that's not that many, but a lot of individuals consume much more than that after a race. Okay, so now I'm gonna like, I'm, this is not an advertisement in any way, shape or form. This is actual studies. I just happen to have one of these. So. It does involve a paid membership. What's a whoop? A whoop. That's this thing. Oh, okay. That thing you're always like, what's that? Okay, so this is a newer fitness technology wearable thing. It tracks a bunch of stuff. If you're a huge data person, that's why I got it. 99.7% heart rate accuracy. They actually, Journal of Sleep Medicine did a study on multiple different types of fitness trackers. So this was not done by the boot makers. This was done by an independent journal looking at all different types of fitness things. What they said about this technology and why I'm even talking about it, which we'll get to with the recovery related to alcohol, is that when they looked at how the whoop compares to all of these other things, sleep studies and recovery, um, it matched it pretty spot on. So what does it actually measure? Heart rate variability, resting heart rate, and sleep just sleep performance. That's how it's measuring recovery. So for instance, every morning I get up and I have funny graphs that look like this. Um, and based on the heart rate, heart rate variability, um, it, it can basically say you have this much recovery. So my lower my heart rate, my higher my heart rate variability, I have more recovery that I gained overnight than if my heart rate was high and all of those other things, you know, were off. You know, I think in my life, I get up in the morning and I say, I don't feel good. <laughs> or I get up and say, I feel great. I, I don't need a whoop then. A whoop? A whoop? A whoop? Oh, okay. okay. So the whoop, when you wake up in the morning, there's this journal thing that says, you can set it to say whatever you want. And I think it's in here, but maybe not. Most whoop people, one of their journal, I know it's hard to say, one of the journal things every morning is, did you consume alcohol the day before? Most, like 95% of people who have a whoop leave that in their journal. There's other things that like track menstrual cycles or did you, are you parenting at the moment? Are you sick with COVID? Or there's all these different things. Like, did you feel hydrated? That's the next most tracked one, which will be important here in a second. But if you say, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't. <laughs> I was going to do screenshots of my whoop in the mornings and I just <laughs> didn't get there. Um, and so you say, yes, I had alcohol. Okay, how many did you have? And you put in how many you had. And then it says, when was your first drink? So was your first drink at a mimosa at 10 a.m. or was your first drink at 8 p.m.? Um, and so it kind of factors all this in, which then you can correlate to whatever the heart rate variability and resting heart rate measured out as. So every week you get this journal and every month they do a summary and says, wow, your, I should have done screenshots. It would have made way more sense. Basically, they say, according to your journal and your recovery entries in your whoop, 
the things that had the most positive impact on recovery were getting more than seven hours of sleep, were staying hydrated. The most negative things on your sleep was working split shifts or if like you're up at night for work. Um, if you had alcohol and we'll explain the alcohol in a minute. Um, there you go. It also tracks your strain. So whatever physical activity you can do, it's in there. I'd be very interested if anybody else on this on this talk has a whoop. So if you do, please just chat, chat it. that in because I'm thinking she's the only person. Yep. Yes. One person. Hey, one so, person. I'm not the only one. And tell me, thank you. It is the most, if you're a data person. <laughs> you know, I used to watch this game show when I was young and they'd say whoopee. Did, did they have whoopee? Uh, that's totally different then. <laughs> See, I think Dave re remembers that one, that game show. Yeah. It is so funny. So I was at skating the other day and one of the parents after this meeting, it's not that different. <laughs> one, one of the parents had come up to me and said, is that a whoop? And I said, yes, well, he actually does studies. Like he works for a company that does studies on all these fitness trackers as well. And there's this new thing, it's called an aura. It's a ring, but no whoop by far has the most data. Um, the reality is, is once you know your patterns and you know the things, like, is it really worth the subscription? Probably not, except it's still really cool every day. I kind of tested it. <laughs> they needed a better name. I kind of tested mine. Like I would not look at my journal in the morning. I would not go through any of it. And I would just go for a run and it'd be like, this fun felt great today. Even if I didn't necessarily get as much sleep. And then you'd look at the, oh, you had 95% recovery. Okay, that makes sense. Some days where I even got a lot of sleep, but my recovery wasn't as good because of different variables. That's the run that feels like you're dragging through mud or whatever. So mm. you know what those days are like. This can show you and can follow your journal trends and give you an idea of why your recovery sucks. See, at my age, I just don't remember what I did the night before. So it just, I don't care. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So what they have found doing all these studies using this whoop device is that the timing of the alcohol is very important. So the further away from going to bed, you have higher recovery. So if you have a drink right before bed, your recovery is not going to be good. If you maybe had a drink during the Vikings game at noon, but you didn't go to bed until 9 p.m., your recovery might not be that bad. There's actually data according to this. So if your last drink was between four and nine hours prior to going to bed, um, your recovery drop is only 1%. So Hmm. four hours, five hours, whatever. So the further away, you have less drop in your recovery. Hmm. If it's between one hour before going to bed and four hours before going, to go and before going to bed, you have much larger drop in your recovery. Does this have to do with sleep though? For instance, are you saying that <laughs> Dave, um, the chat is just too funny, but, I, it it's great. but if you go to bed, does it, does it, yeah. Um, yes. Does so, it matter, you know, how far before you go to bed do you have to have that drink where they've seen that the recovery is better? That's the question I'm trying to figure out. Here. Yeah. The longer before you have the, the, the drink, better the sleep is. The better the sleep is. And in the morning when you get your sleep, gosh, I should have done that. I'll send it out later. Everybody, you can see what my whoop looked like. I had really good recovery last night, so I can break that. That didn't it. sound right. But when you click on the sleep tab, it actually you can break it down. You can click on REM, and it actually highlights during the night where you were in REM, where you were awake, where you were in light sleep, where you were in deep sleep. And if you have alcohol too close to going to bed, your deep sleep and your REM sleep is much lower. Hmm. Resting heart rate's higher. Heart rate variability is lower. Thus, the crappy recovery. So basically, it's the more time you give your body to process the alcohol, the better, because you're awake and able to process it better. And your body's not also trying to get into healthy sleep to recover. So amount of alcohol also matters, not just the timing. So for every drink consumed, there is a trend in the resting heart rate. So for every drink, your resting heart rate increases. It's not a huge number, but it does factor. Hmm. The heart rate variability, which is actually one of the things that impacts your recovery more. So the beat to beat variability and how much your heart varies overnight um, decreases more substantially and your re recovery decreases. Yeah. What do you mean by, by recovery, bit. though? Your ability. So it tracks your body's 
rest, your sleep, the amount of deep sleep, the okay. amount of REM sleep. And the more of all of that, the more your body is recovered and ready for strain or exercise the next day. Okay. So it's just based on how restful things were yes. and how much. Okay. Yes. And they did this uh, compared to like sleep studies and all of that, like in, in hospital sleep studies and we're able to compare and it matched with all of those. Mm. So what about hydration? This is why hydration and water somehow it ends up being the second most track thing on the booth is that we know alcohol is that diuretic we talked about. So wearers who noted that they were sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> That, you know, that is very true. That's yeah. funny. And that's probably related to some of this, the the things that they do with the pilots about how yeah. long they have to not have anything to drink. Okay. So a person who in their journal marks, the yes, essay was sufficiently hydrated. By the way, if you put, did you feel hydrated? And you put yes, it then asks you how many glasses of water did you drink? So it actually makes you like actually answer that question. Um, so people who felt hydrated, their average recovery in the morning was 55%, which is in the yellow zone, which means you can do fairly moderate exercise that day. If you're in the green zone, you should probably do your hardest day of workout that day. So if you're going to go out and do a 20 mile run on Saturday, because you're training for a marathon Friday night, you better not go out and have drinks because you will not love your 20 mile run. Mm. I mean, not that anyone loves their 20 mile run, but you will really not love it. If people consume alcohol, but they weren't adequately hydrated, their recovery ends up being lower, about 5% lower mm. on average than if they had it. Mm. And just, I mean, the reality is, is this is, again, a paid subscription. Who owns a Whoop? Probably not. This Only is one gonna person. Be two. Two. Okay. My sister-in-law does. Um, this kind of group that has one is probably selecting out. And so... Mm -hmm that data how this would change in a if you sent if you gave one of these to everybody in you know the town and tracked theirs it would be interesting to see what their recovery looked like people who people who exercise to a pathologic level such as myself at times are the people who own these not making assumptions on you julie but people i know who have them are much like that oh well there you go see pathological mm -hmm. fitness level no so that so it, it is going to filter out so this data it'd be interesting to see if you put this on just a person who maybe exercises a couple of times a week or doesn't exercise at all what their recovery looks like there's the next study my hoop is always mad at me yes my do i hate the red button okay so the final section on exercise and alcohol motivation so this is super cool. This section, I just loved this rabbit hole I went down. So this is actually in the, art, the journal of bicycling. I'm surprised. Do you, mm. do you get that one? No. I'm sorry, I'm surprised. Okay, so this this Dr. Shuval or Shuval, um, the literature reported there's a licensing effect. Basically, you give yourself permission to have a vice if you exercise. Like, oh, I ran a marathon today. I can go out and eat whatever I want. I ran a 10K. I can drink and celebrate. So there is that. So they did a study, 38,000 healthy patients. So this is a new study that just got published this year called the Fit and Tipsy Study. Y'all can Google this. It is everywhere. I know I, it's in the references if y'all want to see it. 38,000 patients, average age of 46, but look at that span. It really spanned everything. So what did they do? They assessed their alcohol intake. So this was a this was a study person's questionnaire about how much they were consuming alcohol wise. And then they put them all on like a treadmill stress test. So they were classified fitness level, low, moderate or high. And they did take into account, ge account gender and age. So obviously a 20 year old was going to be rated in low, moderate, high, different than the 86 year old. But they did it based on, you know, statistical where people fall. Alcohol consumption less than or equal to three times a week would, was considered light alcohol, moderate four to seven for women, four to 14 for men, um, which fits normal alcohol standards, and then greater than or equal to eight or 15 was considered heavy alcohol consumption. What they found is moderate to high fitness individuals have more alcohol intake this is 38,000 people. Mm. So if a woman was classified as having moderate fitness, they were 1.6 times more likely to consume in the moderate to heavy alcohol 
span. If they were a high fitness person, two times more likely to consume the higher moderate levels of alcohol. Men, interestingly enough, were actually a little bit lower, but still higher than the people who were in the low fitness. Super fascinating. So some of this was exercise training can reinforce the same sensation, sensation seeking behavior that leads people to drink. So now we're getting into the whole dopamine cycle. So is exercise an addiction? Now I need to do that. Echo. So different things that they pull, I pulled out of this article to extend the good feelings from an exercise induced dopamine increase. You drink alcohol after their workout. So you kind of want to continue that runner's high, if you will. Both activities, if you're doing a race or you're doing a team sport, um, drinking often are done socially and social interactions also can increase your dopamine. So if you're combining exercise, alcohol and social interaction, you now are supposedly increasing your dopamine levels and feel good activities more. So the final, and I, I don't know what raise means. I think this must be some type of soccer team in Europe is my guess, but it fit perfectly. Um, so it's the whole work hard, play hard adage. Like this is the licensing effect. Um, you're socializing, therefore, okay. Both alcohol and exercise can be a stress reliever. Um, but then there's the flip side, body image. Am I exercising for, you know, a body image type thing? Um, and then the guilt. Uh, so it's kind of the whole cycling effect of other use disorders. Um, and then we all know that there is this association between athletics and alcohol performance or promotion such as this. Think about the Super Bowl. Alcohol is advertised all the time um, in, with, with athletics, especially professional um, sports. What the take home of this whole study was, not the whole take home, but a big part of the take home and why they did this is obviously for having physical exams, they always ask about alcohol, smoking, other drugs of abuse. It's important to also, of course, ask about fitness and exercise. Are you getting exercise? How much? Um, but then also trying to put that correlation together because if people are exercising a lot, consider that their alcohol might be higher than they may be necessarily divulging. Um, so just knowing that there is this trend that increased alcohol with increased um, physical activity. Did you come up with anything, you know, when we look at, uh, people especially who really train hard mm -hmm. and you, a lot of people on the call have probably seen some of these studies where literally anything over about four miles a day for running your risk of heart attack actually goes up as you get older and of course alcohol is also an inflammatory mm -hmm. and did you see anything about alcohol and extreme exercise as far as heart disease i did not look specifically at that because they both, I mean, the studies on the alcohol with the heart disease, that's my whole tangent in the beginning. Yeah. And then alcohol, the inflammatory and just bad on exercise. I did not look at those two together. Cause that's kind of interesting to me. Cause that's that, very interesting. Cause I can think of people in my, in my life, uh, having run my whole life. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So with that, yeah, alcohol has a lot of detrimental cardiovascular effects. Even moderate amounts can negatively impact your ability to recover and or exercise um, and or make gains. So if you're training for something, you know, take an alcohol hiatus. Um, there's a lot of physiological properties that explain that. Um, and then really just understanding that there shouldn't be this licensing permission-y, permission is that a word? effect probably not uh, no so there's a lot of references i only quoted a lot several of them in the thing but here's your um tipsy right here in case y'all want to know it's on the second page of references shoe ball actually a thing hmm. so all right ooh, what did I other do? questions looks like i'm an outlier Yes, the sleep issues are horrible. And the muscle, like, see, it fits perfectly. Mm. That was the one thing I noticed on my whoop right away. And my sister-in-law and I went for a run one day and we're like, God, why does run suck? But we had hung out the night before and there was something going on. And it was like, man, my heart rate variability is horrible. Um, mm. And the trends. All right. 
Any other questions? I think I asked all mine as we went, so. So there is a lot of literature um, about pilots and drinking and even uh, just a couple of drinks, how much, even though they wait the, the eight to 12 hours before getting behind the throttle, they, they, they're still impaired. Well, and a lot of that um, is due to their not getting good sleep. You know, they go, they land in a new state or a new airport area. They go out and hang out with whomever there, go to sleep, have very impaired sleep, and then have to get up. You know, that's eight to 12 hours until they're supposed to be flying again. And they just haven't had that good restful sleep. On top of the alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Any other questions? So we should all breathalyze and. Yeah. Somehow sleep test every pilot as we get on an airplane. I mean, oh. I don't, I don't know about, I don't know about commercial airlines, but in the Air Force, you have to fill out a survey before you fly of like what kind of stress you're under, how much sleep you've gotten, things like that, and they come up with a score for, for your kind of overall mental state, I guess, and. You know, and then they look at it and they have it on record. If something happens, you know, like they can point to, ooh, maybe that person shouldn't have been flying. Yeah. But then I wonder if having that data is worse for liability reasons, because then they yeah. know about it and they let them fly. Yeah, but as a pilot, don't you know what not to put on there so they wouldn't so that they wouldn't ground you? Yeah. Aaron, yeah. Yeah. Air Force doesn't have the same liability as the airlines, though. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. That's true. But the thing is, all the all the rules for pilots are we, we say they're written in blood. Mm. I mean, yeah. But then Jessica mentioned that most of them have are prescribed Ambien, so Ambien on top of alcohol, and yeah. Hey, let's all go. Although the airport is still one of my favorite places, I don't care. I'm just going to get on airplanes all the time, regardless. Although I have a family member who had to get grounded and had like got forced into um, alcohol treatment. Um, and their minimum was like six to 12 months of treatment with darn near testing almost every day to make sure that was a complete abstinence before there was any allowance to fly again. Wow. But he got away with it got away with it that's bad terminology but like he flew for a really long time in a high-risk situation um yeah john you don't need a whoop yes, i don't have one so great you never had one you like data you need one but yeah and heather you're not sending out whoop pictures there's a great app it's got a great app yeah the is best it, part is, is compared was it your laughing that you were thinking of Kurt? Yeah, no, there was some show about, you know, when the last time. Oh, the yeah. dating game. Yeah, the dating game. Whoopee. Oh, there you or go. Newly, uh, the newlywed game. Yeah, so every time she said that, I laughed. Sorry. It's <laughs> like, yeah. The coolest thing versus like any other thing is you don't ever have to take this off. It's got an external battery you plug in and then you slide it on and it charges it and it lasts for like three days, but you never actually take the device off. So there's never any gaps in anything. In my life, that's too much information, but okay. All right, everybody. Well, thanks again. Good talk. And uh, we'll be back next week. With the uh, rural area and the prevention in greater, greater Minnesota, primarily. So. All right. All right. Take care, everyone.